Hello viewers, I'm Professor Sharanjit, working at the Rajiv Gandhi National University of Law, Punjab. Today we shall discuss the evolution and philosophical foundations of prisons in India. Dear viewers, before discussing the evolution and philosophical foundations of prisons in India, it becomes imperative to throw some light on penology. Penology is a part of criminology. It is made up of two words, pino, which means fine or penalty, and ology, which means study. In simple words, we can say that penology is the study of punishment. As per the Oxford English Dictionary, penology is the study of the punishment of crime and prison management. As society advanced and marched towards a more civilized existence, more refined ways of punishing wrongdoers emerged. With the passage of time, thinkers throughout the world started studying penology. Cesare Beccaria was the first modern penologist. The primary emphasis of criminologists and penologists was to rationalize the punishment in tune with the crime committed by the offender. As in the primitive societies, punishment was very harsh and cruel, like flogging, chopping off of body parts, throwing before wild beasts, and putting the wrongdoer in hot boiling oil. It is significant to mention the modern clinical school, which promoted the social protection theory of punishment. In line with this new approach, it is important to note that instead of the term punishment, the term correction is often used. Hence, modern prisons are often called correctional institutions. Penology in the Indian context has been understood differently at different points of time. This is also reflected in the philosophical foundations of prisons. In the earliest times, when crime was taking place but the state was not developed and the concept of prisons was not in existence, punishment was inflicted by way of retribution. It was by the clan of the victim. Private vengeance and retribution were practiced and the emphasis was on the victim and the degree of harm suffered by him or her. The offender was equally harmed. In the tribal areas, punishment was given by the chief of the tribe. As the society progressed, gradually the state also became powerful and the king used to punish the wrongdoer with appropriate punishment, which was mostly harsh, barbaric and inhuman, so as to set an example for the rest of the society. In ancient times, detention in prisons was not used on a routine basis. People were usually given physical forms of punishment like whipping, mutilation, public hanging, blackening of the face and parading in the streets. The wrongdoers were punished publicly in order to create deterrence among the like-minded people. It is important to note that during medieval times in India, religion dominated the social settings. The caste system was also very prominent in the sense that Brahmins were most of the times awarded less punishment in comparison to the Shudras and other smaller castes. As religion was dominant, punishment was given for the purpose of cleansing the soul of the wrongdoer. Now we shall talk about the concept of punishment in ancient India. In the ancient period, as per the ancient texts, the king was the supreme authority. The king used to rule the kingdom with the help of certain rules called dharmas. The main dharmas were ahinsa, which is non-violence, satya, which is truthfulness, artya, which is not coveting the property of others, shocham, which is purity, and indriyangrahana, which is control of the senses. 
the king was to protect the lives of his subjects and anyone who violated the dharma was punished by the king punishment during those times was known as dand according to manu the king was called the dand chatradhari who is the holder of the danda and chatra means the protector emphasizing the importance of punishment manu said punishment remains awake when people are asleep so the wise have recognized punishment itself as a form of dharma in this context it is important to note that punishment during those times was usually physical in nature and the prison system had not evolved much punishments like the death penalty flogging throwing before the wild beasts public hanging and lashing were also given in public in order to keep the people from committing sins and evil deeds there is a reference to prisons in the ramayana and mahabharata from the religious texts it can be seen that imprisonment as a mode of punishment was highly practiced in ancient india the purpose of imprisonment was to separate the wrong doer from the society in the ancient text by manu there is a mention of niruta which is imprisonment as punishment for only one particular offense which is theft of gold belonging to a brahman whereas in kautalya's arthashastra there are detailed references to the construction of prisons and prison management references are also found in the ancient texts about the lodging of prisoners of war ajat shatru confined his father bimbasara to rajgrah the capital of magadha similarly the parents of lord krishna were also confined in a prison by his maternal uncle and lord krishna was born in the prison itself in most of the cases imprisonment was not used for ordinary criminals during those ancient times the crimes were divided into three groups offenses against god offenses against the state and offenses against private persons so the punishment was also classified accordingly the punishment prescribed for all these offenses could be death fines mutilation of the offender's limbs corporal punishment banishment subjecting to humiliations whipping or forfeiture of rank and title whereas imprisonment was not a normal feature during those times some rooms in forts popularly known as bandi khanas were reserved for the prisoners during the period of muslim rule in india the muslim law provided for four types of punishments namely kissa diya had and tezan dear viewers now we shall talk about the prisons during colonial rule in india originally a trade corporation the british eventually built up a sizable empire in india they passed various laws and occasionally established new commissions and committees in order to maintain their control over the nation lord mekole suggested the creation of the prison discipline committee in 1835 after calling attention to the deplorable circumstances in the indian jails the idea that the best criminal code can be of very little benefit to the community unless there is a mechanism for the execution of punishment was emphasized in lord mekole's commission report of 1830 this served as the ideological cornerstone of the jail system back then the main recommendations of this report were to abolish outdoor labor introduce indoor work generally classify prisoners more accurately separate indoor prisoners carefully establish central prisons 
and employ inspectors of prisons to regulate the prison system as a whole. For better prison management in the country, the British rulers constituted jail reforms committees from time to time. The first jail reform committee, which was set in 1838, recommended the establishment of a central jail and the placement of inmates serving terms longer than a year in this facility. Additionally, each state should designate a prison inspector who will periodically check on the operation of the state's jails. Thirdly, every jail should have enough living quarters. The subordinate establishments, corruption, the lack of discipline and the system of using prisoners as extra labour on the public roads were all noted by the committee in the report as the worst forms of treatment this class of people could have ever received from the British government. This first All India Jail Committee denounced the practice of using inmates to build roads, clean drains and do other labour intensive tasks. The North Province appointed the Inspector General of Prisons for the first time in 1844. The Indian government established it as a permanent position in 1850 and recommended that an Inspector General of Police can be appointed to each province. When the Indian Penal Code was enacted in 1860, incarceration was acknowledged as a type of punishment for majority of the offences. Since the Indian Penal Code called for imprisonment for every offence listed, it played a significant role in reforming the nation's jail system. It is significant to remember that the Second Jail Inquiry Committee identified the unhygienic conditions in the Indian prisons as the cause of multiple inmates' illnesses, deaths and ailments. The Second Jail Committee suggested providing each prisoner with a minimum amount of space inside the facility, improving food and clothing standards and conducting routine medical examinations for the inmates. The Northwest Province hired civil physicians as district jail superintendents in 1862. In 1877, the Third Jail Inquiry Commission was established. The others were formed in 1889 and 1892. The fundamental goal of the Prison Act of 1894 was to establish national uniformity in the management of the prisons. The Indian Jail Reforms Commission suggested that juvenile offenders be housed in separate facilities named as Borstal Schools. This committee concluded that the system of hiring prisoners was unfavourable since it not only allowed for incorrect prisoner classification but also made it challenging to maintain prisoner discipline. The committee suggested that only in cases where the site of the job and the climate were suitable and adequate plans were in place to provide the offenders with water would such employment of the inmates be approved. Given this, the committee was against the inmates working in canals and building railroad lines because they required the prisoners to be moved, resulting in unhygienic living conditions in makeshift shelters and tents. This committee also proposed the idea of open prisons. According to the Commission, open prisons and jobs that resembled the ones that released inmates would take after their release were superior and would have a more reformative effect on the offender. It was the first time that the inmates' reformation was given such priority. The committee noted that when it comes to the reformative aspect of jail labour, the Indian prison administration is falling behind. Thus, 
it has been unable to recognize the prisoner as an individual and has instead thought of him as a component of the state apparatus. It has forgotten the potential effects that humanizing and civilized factors could have on each prisoner's mind. Among the other crucial recommendations were that skilled jail guards should manage the jail, the jailer needs to have previous management experience in a jail, there should be a doctor in every jail, the jail gatekeeper needs to have education, the inmates ought to be divided into habitual and first time offenders and flogging should be outlawed because it is a cruel kind of punishment. It should be allowed for the inmates to send and receive letters. Meetings with friends, family and relatives should be permitted for the prisoner. Two pair of clothes should be given to the prisoner. It is time to put the payroll system into place. Terminally ill criminals ought to be housed apart from the other inmates and they shouldn't be punished by being transferred to the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, often known as Kale Pani Ki Saza or transportation for life. Further modifications in India's prison system were made possible by the Prisons Act of 1894. The Act's key components included, it addressed prison administration in our nation for the first time. It also covered prison staff organizational structure, the role and responsibility of prison officers, provisions pertaining to prisoners admission, removal and discharge, classification of prisoners, provisions for food, clothing and bedding of the inmates, employment of prisoners, protection of the inmates health, prison offenses and punishments, and the authority of the state government to make rules by notification in the official gazette regarding matters pertaining to the prisons. In India, which was dominated by the British, a unified system of prison administration was established under the Prisons Act. Additionally, four distinct acts that had varied rules governing jail operations at that time were repealed by the Prisons Act. The Prisons Act was created to establish a comprehensive framework for the housing of prisoners, the management and responsibilities of the prison staff, the appointment and functions of the superintendent of prisons, the medical officer's duties, the reporting of a prisoner's death, the role and responsibility of the jailer, the authority of deputy and assistant jailers and the role and responsibility of subordinate officers in the jail. This act also included regulations for solitary confinement, inspection of inmates upon entrance and prisoner discipline measures including separation, association and segregation. It also addressed the treatment of inmates serving death sentence. The act provided for the food, clothing and bedding of civil and criminal prisoners, the employment of civil and criminal prisoners, the health of prisoners, visits to prisoners and visitor searches with the aim of reformation and the welfare of the prisoners. As a result of the inmates' propensity for committing crime while on the jail grounds, Chapter 10 stipulated penalties for bringing or taking out unacceptable items as well as for interacting with inmates. The law also included penal offences and their several classifications. This act also provided a definition for the term prison. The term prisons refers to any jail or place used permanently or temporarily under the general or special orders of the state government for the detention of the prisoners and includes all lands and buildings attached thereto. 
However, it excludes any location designated by the state government under Section 354 of the Code of Criminal Procedure, any location for the confinement of prisoners who were exclusively in the custody of the police and any location that has been declared as subsidiary cell by the state government through a general or special order. The criminal and civil prisoners are defined differently in the Prisons Act. Any prisoner duly committed to custody under the warrant or order of any court or authority exercising criminal jurisdiction or by order of a court martial is what this act defines as a criminal prisoner. Any prisoner who is not a criminal prisoner was the definition of a civil prisoner. The Prisoners Act of 1900 was passed in order to codify the laws pertaining to inmates under judicial authority. The Government of India Act 1919 was later passed into law as well. This act established the prison as state property. This act gave state governments complete discretion and responsibility over the jail matters, removing any central oversight or control. As a result of this act, the nation's governments made jail reforms at a low priority. The Jail Reforms Committee of 1946 played an important role in the further improvement of prison administration in India. The key suggestions of this committee were that modern jails should be constructed and that the classification of prisoners should be on scientific lines like child offenders, adult offenders, habitual offenders, casual offenders, mentally ill offenders and handicapped offenders. Constitution of advisory boards, recruitment, selection and training of prison personnel, daily routine and education of prisoners, vocational training, aftercare and rehabilitation of prisoners, architecture and building of prisons and basic facilities in the prisons are the other key suggestions among others. In the end, I would like to say that in today's lecture, we could understand how the prison system has evolved in India from ancient times to the modern times. As discussed, in the ancient and medieval times, prisons were meant merely for the custody of the wrongdoers and to separate them from the society. They were separated from the society not only as a form of punishment but also for protecting the society from them. The Hindu and Muslim rulers in India devised different modes with regards to imprisonment during those times. Prisons were inhumane places and no attention was given to the reformation of the wrongdoer. Harsh physical punishments were usually given to the wrongdoers and criminals to serve as a deterrence to the rest of the society. From the historical texts, we can get an insight into the prison system in ancient India. As discussed, the concept of prisons can be traced back to the Rig Veda, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. However, during those times, imprisonment was not a popular mode of punishing the wrongdoer as physical punishments were given to the wrongdoer and prisons were used only in special and exceptional circumstances. It was only after the arrival of the British in the country that the prison structure was formalized. When the British rulers came to India, they realized that the prison system needed to be changed. With the introduction of the Indian Penal Code 1860, imprisonment became one form of punishment for the majority of the offences under this law. Hence, the British rulers felt the necessity of creating a proper prison system in the country. 
they set up various committees from time to time in order to understand the need for a robust prison system. Specific legislations like the Prisons Act of 1894 and the Prisoners Act of 1900 were also enacted. Another aspect is that the prisons were meant not only for the custody of ordinary criminals but also for silencing the freedom struggle. The Indian revolutionaries and freedom fighters were sent to prisons across the country and were also given the punishment of transportation for life, whereby they were sent to Andaman and Nicobar Islands as a form of punishment. With this, we come to an end of today's lecture. Thank you.